Welcome! In this video, I am going to show you how to find the inverse of three different functions as well as cover the top three mistakes that I see my students make. And I chose these three examples because this is what we recently did in my class and I wanted to make sure I could share it with you so you can see the top mistakes and avoid them when you're working on finding the inverse. So in the first example, we have a linear equation. And remember, when we're finding the inverse, we're going to replace our function notation with our y. That's just going to make things a little bit easier to work with. You can go ahead and swap the variables. That's something that we made sense of by looking at the graphs of a function and its inverse. And then from here, you actually have to swap the variables. Um, and then from there, now you're just going to go ahead and solve for y using our inverse operation. And that's where our first mistake comes from. So we're going to go ahead and subtract a 6 on both sides, right? We get x minus 6 equals a negative 1 third y. A lot of students still do not like fractions, right? So they, th you know, a, a common mistake, but not the major mistake, is they, you know, need to get rid of this negative 1 third. I prefer to multiply by the reciprocal on both sides. But be careful, if you write it like me, you just made that in the first mistake. And what I mean by that is it's not negative 3 times x. When you multiply negative 3 on both sides, you're multiplying not x by negative 3, but the quantity x minus 6. So that first major mistake students make is they do not use parentheses to represent the multiplication of the quantity. Now you could distribute it if you wanted to, but I'm going to leave it outside just so I could, um, just so I can leave my example and see everything where it's at. Anytime you have a number multiplied by its reciprocal, those are going to multiply to 1. We're going to equal y. We can write them, rewrite, or rearrange them. And then we can back introduce the f inverse of x, or the f inverse notation. So swap back out the y. And there you go. So make sure you're using those parentheses when you are solving. In the next example, um, we have a couple, a couple of issues with this one. But again, we're going to start with what we know, which is first to replace the f of x with y. Then we swap the variables. So we have x is equal to a y plus 1 all over a 2y minus 1. So the mistake that students make in this one is either, there's actually kind of two of them. I'm just going to embed them in kind of one. But two, well, actually, I'll get to the major mistake here in a second. But two, they try to solve for y in the denominator. You can't solve for y in the denominator, nor can you solve for two different y's in the same equation, right? So a couple things we have to do. We have to get rid of the variable in the denominator, and we have to combine these variables. So to get my 2y minus 1 off the denominator, I'm going to multiply by 2y minus 1. Again, I'm using parentheses because I don't want to make that first mistake, right? We don't want to make the mistake over here. Now, I am going to distribute this, and then these divide out because of the division property. And that's going to leave me with a 2yx minus 1, or 2yx, I'm sorry, minus x equals y plus 1. All right, so now we have a variable on both sides. And if you recall, we can only solve a variable when they're on the same side. So the other mistake that students will make here is they will try to you know, combine like terms here. And, or they get stuck. They either make something up. So we have 2yx minus y is equal to a, I'm just going to rewrite this as an x plus 1. So there's a lot of mistakes that students will make here. One, they'll try to combine these. But they're not like terms, so you can't combine them. Another one is they try to divide by y on both sides. And that's great. That gets rid of the y on the left-hand side. But guess, but guess what that does on the right-hand side? That gives us a y on the right-hand side. So you cannot just divide by y to get rid of it. And you cannot combine like terms. So it's the second mistake is not knowing how to solve or how to isolate the y. And there's many, many different variations or mistakes that students will do. And what you need to do is to solve this, actually, is just to factor. So you're going to take the common term, which is a y, and factor it out. Now you're going to be left with a 2x minus 1 equals an x plus 1. And now you can see my variable y. To isolate it, I'm just going to divide by 2x minus 1. And therefore, I will reintroduce my inverse notation, f inverse of x equals x plus 1 divided by 2x minus 1. And there you go. All right, the last mistake is, uh, is going to be a big one. And again, it really kind of comes into part of the lesson as far as fully understanding um, the domains of a function and the range. Uh, of the function and its inverse. But, um, but what we're going to do is we're just going to follow the operations first, and then we'll kind of go back into the understanding of where this mistake comes from. So first of all, let's just replace it with this y. Let's swap the variables. Okay, 
And then let's keep on swapping your variables. I'm making that mistake all the time. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and use our inverse operation. So that's a negative x equals square root of 2y. We're going to undo squaring by or undo the square root by squaring on both sides. And therefore, I get a negative squared equals 2y divided by 2, divided by 2. And I'm just going to rewrite this in this format, 1y half negative x squared. Now again, you could write that as a x positive x squared. I get it. But I'm just going to leave it from here. Now here's the point that I want you to make. And again, you have to understand the graphing portion. And if you want to confirm my graphs, go on to Desmos, you know, an online graphing calculator, and confirm. But here's where the understanding of the graph comes from. This is the graph. If you look at the, if you remember a function and its graph, this graph has a reflection about the x-axis. Okay, so originally, actually, there is the square root graph. Okay, so if I'm going to apply my transformations to graph it. I'm going to reflect about the x-axis, and I'm going to have a horizontal compression of 2. So this graph is going to look something like this. All right, so that is going to be my f of x. Now, if this is my inverse, which it is, let me, let me go and write this, f inverse of x, that is the inverse. What does this graph look like? Well, again, let's go through the transformations. That's why I left that there, is because I wanted to see the transformations. I did the same thing over here, because I like to see the transformations in case I need to graph it. But either way, I have a, hor a vertical compression of 1 half and a reflection about the y-axis. So this graph you know, is going to look something like this. Now remember, the, a function and its inverse, the whole reason why we swap the x and the y is because they are symmetrical about the y equals x line. So does this graph, when you flip it across this dashed line, does it produce a parabola? No, that doesn't even make any sense. How does this produce now a double equation? It doesn't. It can't, right? So what that means is it only produces a portion of the function. So our inverse is algebraically correct, but what we need to do is we need to apply a restriction. We need to either take, should we take the positive version of the graph, or sorry, the negative version, or the positive version. And hopefully, visually, you can kind of see if we erase the positive version, that now we have a function that a inverse that is a reflection, right? So that we can say this is the f inverse of x. So the answer or the equation is correct, but now we need to add our restriction, which is x has to be less than or equal to zero. So the third and final mistake that students will make is when we have a problem where there needs to be a restriction, they will forget to add the restriction. And again, it's very helpful to know the graphs so you know when to expect that you need a restriction. Because remember, for a function to be invertible, or for a function to be in, um, invertible, it has to be one to one. It has, it has to pass the horizontal line test. But there you go, guys. Those are the three major mistakes that I covered um, in the classroom this week. And I, hopefully, that can be helpful for you. See you guys in the next video. Cheers.